when you are focused, you usually have a little bit of cortisol, a bunch of norepinephrine in your system and your brain waves are in high beta, which is a fast moving wave and it's where your brain is right now. Flow, brainwave wise, takes place near this borderline between alpha and theta. So neurobiologically, there's massive differences between focus and flow. What does it take to do the impossible? What does it take to level up your game like never before? What does it take for individuals, for organizations, for even institutions to achieve paradigm shifting? Nothing is ever the same again, breakthroughs. Our mission is to decode the neurobiology of flow and cognitive peak performance. Access the minds of maverick scientists, groundbreaking innovators, and world-leading experts to understand what it takes to achieve ultimate human performance. So you can feel your best, perform your best, and accomplish your boldest goals. I'm your host, Rian Doris, and together with best-selling author Stephen Kotler, I present to you Flow Research Collective Radio. So Stephen, I've been a follower of your work and I've been really passionate about everything that you've been doing. I know a lot about the Flow Genome Project. I've heard you speak, but for our audience, they haven't. So can you give me kind of a quick summary, who you are, how you became such an authority on flow and human performance, and also a little bit about what you've been working on since? I am an author, a journalist. I'm the co-founder and director of research for the Flow Genome Project, where I've spent, you know, the past 20 years studying the peak performance state known as flow. And, you know, we at the Flow Genome Project, we're a research and training organization. So on the research side, I think we're the largest open source research project into ultimate human performance in the world. And on the training side, we work with everybody kind of from the U.S. Special Forces through, you know, corporations like Ameritrade or Google to, with the, to the general public, training people up in peak performance. Incredible. And I have to ask, I mean, how did you get into this? Because it's such an understudied, I think, or prior to you, it's such an understudied area. You know, I've heard you say that the vast majority of human brilliance and creativity and excellence comes out of these moments of flow. And yet I can't name a third person but besides you and Chicksamaya who are working in, in this field. So how did you get into this path? Well, do you want the childhood story, the teenage story, or the early 20s story, the late 20s story? Yeah, I ended up on this path three different ways. But let's just say that since I was a little kid, I was obsessed with the question of what does it take to do the impossible, right? What does it take for individuals, organizations, even institutions to level up their game like never before? And, and what does it really take to create kind of paradigm shifting? Nothing is ever the same. Again, breakthroughs. I was obsessed with that. And I've been obsessed with that my entire life. And, you know, around the time, the quick version of this is around the time I was, I turned 30, I got very, very sick. I spent about three years in bed and I managed to cure myself at a time that the doctors didn't think I was ever going to get any better. And my kind of functionality in the world was reduced to less than an hour a day. And the rest of the time I was in extreme pain, lying on a couch and moaning, unable to do anything. And I sort of cured myself using flow states, this, this altered state of consciousness. And, and what, when it sort of happened, I didn't know what the hell was going on, right? I'm a science guy and I was having these very strange altered states of consciousness and they were, you know, curing an illness that was supposedly incurable. And it was baffling. And I, you know, I, I thought that maybe the disease had gotten into my brain and that I was just losing my mind. And anyway, I, I lit out on a kind of giant quest to figure out what the hell happened to me. And I quickly discovered that these altered states I was experiencing had a name. We call them flow states. And I also realized that the same kind of experience that got me from seriously subpar back to normal was getting normal people all the way up to Superman. And that really caught my attention. And then, and it sort of snowballed from there. So that's the very short version of where it came from. Can I ask you what the affliction you were suffering from was? Sure. I had Lyme disease. Oh, wow. That's a tough one. Yeah. It's interesting because Flo, I mean, so Herb Benson, who did a lot of the kind of foundational work on the neurochemistry of Flo, he's at Harvard. 
he pointed out in a book uh, called The Breakthrough Principle that there's a ton of neuroscience underneath flow. And one of the things that happens is you get pumped full of five performance enhancing neurochemicals. Besides enhancing performance, they actually boost the immune system and reset the nervous system in a really powerful way. And an autoimmune condition, Lyme, is a nervous system gone haywire. So like Benson had done the work on the mechanism behind how the hell I, I sort of cured myself. So I stumbled on upon that fairly early on too which helped a lot, right? Proved to me that I wasn't crazy and that there was science here and that this stuff could be understood. I think there's a misconception among the general populace that flow is just when you're really focused. And, you know, it, one is the other, but the other isn't the first in the sense that there are some distinct things like flow is a, a unique in and of itself psychological state that is far above what's happening when you are paying attention really, really hard. Talk to me about that. I mean, how is this a different state of mind? So what we call flow, you may call runner's high or being in the zone or being unconscious or the forever box or in the pocket. The, the lingo is sort of endless, but it's a technical term and it defines an optimal state of consciousness where we feel our best and we perform our best. So first of all, that should differentiate it from focus, right? Mm -hmm. When we're focused, we're focused. We're not feeling our best and performing our best. We might be, but right. More specifically, it refers to those kind of moments of rapt attention and total absorption when focus gets so intense that everything else disappears. Action awareness will merge. Your sense of self vanishes. Time passes strangely. Five hours will go by in like five seconds or it'll slow down. You get a freeze frame effect married to anybody who's been in a car crash. And throughout, as I mentioned, all aspects of performance go through the roof. So, to put this more scientifically, perhaps, when you are focused, you usually have a little bit of cortisol, a bunch of norepinephrine in your system and your brain waves are in high beta, which is a fast moving wave and it's where your brain is right now as we're talking, right? Flow, brainwave wise, takes place near this borderline between alpha, which is, you know, a more relaxed state of consciousness, very similar to where you are when you're daydreaming. And theta, which is a deep meditative state of consciousness that only accessible to most people during REM sleep or during the hypnagogic state when you're falling asleep. So there's a different brainwave signature and neurochemically, uh, stress hormones like norepinephrine and cortisol are mostly flushed out of your system, though you have some norepinephrine still there because it helps sharpen focus and you're filled with dopamine and anandamide, serotonin, oxytocin, a bunch of other neurochemicals. So neurobiologically, there's massive differences between focus and flow. And so I don't remember the exact percentage that I've heard you say, but the theory is that the vast majority of actual work that's getting done, Olympic medalists, you know, their moment of victory, basically that all the good stuff of humanity happens during flow. So we learned, and by we, I mean uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, whose name you mentioned earlier, right, who's sort of the godfather of flow psychology, though he's not the first one to study it. People have been studying flow scientifically since the 1870s. But Csikszentmihalyi in the 70s and 80s, early 90s, was the chairman of the University of Chicago Psychology Department. And he made a number of kind of foundational discoveries about flow that sort of speak to what you're talking about. One is he defined the state. He figured out that it's measurable. He figured out it's ubiquitous. So anybody can, you know, anyone anywhere can can end up in flow, provided certain initial conditions are met. And more specifically, and this was the first clue into like what you're talking about, was he discovered that the people who test the highest, like off the charts for overall life satisfaction, well-being, meaning, purpose, those kinds of things, were all the people with the most flow in their lives. That was tantalizing. From that point after he kind of broke down some of the psychology, researchers turned themselves to the next question, which was, all right, this is optimal performance. How optimal, right? We know it's good for well-being and life satisfaction and meaning, and those are important, but what else is it good for? And the answer is, holy crap, right? Like what we now know is that pretty much a flow state sits at the heart, as you pointed out, of every gold medal or world championship that's been won. It accounts for significant progress in the art, major breakthroughs in science. In business, we've got actually some hard numbers. McKinsey did a 10-year study, the business consultants, and they found the top executives are 500% more productive in flow. 
So uh, kind of across the boards, we now know that you know flow is the signature of optimal performance. And it, it's really worth hitting this again, which is to say that like we are all hardwired for optimal performance. This is what we do as humans, actually as mammals, to perform at our best. So pretty much any high performance system out there, the goal, at least underneath the hood, has to be to move people towards flow because this is how we're hardwired for you know ultimate performance. I want to ask you, can we hack our way into flow? Can we will our way or how can we get into it more consistently and reliably? Well, you can't will your way there. So here's Here's what we've learned. And a lot of this was research. Some of it was done. Uh, there was actually work done at, that we did, the Flow Genome Project. And there was a, there's a kind of a, been a parallel research project in Sweden at the Karolinska Institute. And we weren't really in communication with one another, but we, we've both driven in the same direction and discovered the same thing, which is we now know that flow states have triggers, preconditions that lead to more flow. And there are about 20 of them that we know of. There's probably way, way more, but we know of 20. And the simplest way to think about this is the one thing we know to be absolutely certainly true about flow is it can only show up when you're, all your attention is focused in the right here, the right now, in the present mm. moment. So that's really what these triggers do. They drive attention into the present moment. Or, you know, if I were to put it more formally, I'd say, hey, these 20 things are among the 20 things that evolution shaped our brain to pay the most attention to. And what we've discovered is that Shit is really trainable. And, and I got to tell you, man, like that was shocking news to me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. When we started this research, we started working with the best of the best, elite special forces, you know, top professional and Olympic athletes, that top CEO, that level of thing. And we thought we needed to be working there mainly because it was going to be so hard. What we've learned, and I'll give you a, a classic example. So we did a couple of years ago, a joint learning project at Google. And we took about 80 Googlers, I think it was 80, might be 60, from all over the company, everywhere, you know, facilities and engineering, coders, PR, marketing, take your pick. And uh, we trained them up in the four high performance basics. And I mean basics, man, like sleep hygiene, get seven to eight hours of sleep a night and be really protective of your sleep and you know that sort of thing. And then the use of four flow triggers. And after a six-week course that had about an hour of homework a day, we saw a 35 to 80% boost in flow. Wow. That's life-changing. So, yeah, wait, wait, wait. Like, let me take it one step further for <laughs> you, which is we – so we got it at the Flow Genome Project, right? You go to our website. There's a Flow Fundamentals course. Anybody can take it. And we've – Taking uh, it right now. <laughs> but close to 1,000 people have taken it. And we measure pre and post, Right. And what we're finding is that on average, measuring seven different metrics for flow, we're seeing a 70% boost per metric. And the point I'm making here, well, two points. One, McKinsey, just to put this in perspective for you, when they did their work, they figured out that most people, probably without knowing it, and I can talk about why if you're curious, spend about 5% of their work life in flow. If you could boost that to about 20%, so a 15 percentage point jump, overall workplace productivity in America would double. That's crazy, right? So we got, you know, these huge boosts. And what I want to point out is that it's not entirely, well, I'll take some credit, but it's not entirely that our Kung Fu is so good. It's that this stuff is really easy to train. It's really easy to train. It's funny. I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday who's kind of a neuropsychologist and we were talking about the same thing that like a lot of what we're discovering about, you know, high performance is it's not that hard to train. You have to do it. You have to be diligent about it. And it requires it requires sort of living in different ways than we're accustomed to living. But it's not crazy difficult. And this is not to say that, you know, anybody who takes this advice can go out and, you know, swim like Michael Phelps or, you know, write books like. Tolstoy, right? But everybody can, you know, massively improve their performance with this stuff. That's for sure. This is super incredible. Tell me about some of those triggers that people can be aware of to start optimizing and getting into flow. Well, there's a ton of them, but the place to start is it with a chick sent me high discovery, one of the most like foundational triggers. It's often called the golden rule of flow. 
It's the challenge skills balance. But mm-hmm. right? the idea mm-hmm. here is that we pay the most attention to the present, right? Most focus in the now when the challenge, the task at hand slightly exceeds our skill set. So you want to stretch but not snap, right? It's a little, little, little boost. And emotionally, I would say that this sort of exists near but not on the midpoint between boredom, not enough stimulation, I'm not paying attention, and anxiety, whoa, way too much, right? I'm paying way too much attention. In in between what's known as the flow channel, or if you speak physiology, it's sort of just above the Erks dobson curve. And uh, this is the sweet spot for flow. And what's interesting about this sweet spot is it tends to screw people up on two ways. The first is that if you're shy, a little risk averse, a little anxious, a little neurotic, take your pick. And I'm a lot of those things, by the way. <laughs> your flow shows up outside your comfort zone. You have to push yourself outside your comfort zone. So you have to get really comfortable with being uncomfortable, but just a little, right? Um, but you have to really do this day after day, week after week, year after year. For top performers, for overachievers, for hyperactive type A's, of which I also fall in that category a little, you will blow past this sweet spot without even noticing it, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, for reasons that are a little complicated, we think it's about 4%, we think that the right number is when the challenge is about 4% greater than your skill set. So top performers will take on challenges that are 10, 20, 30, 40, 50% greater than their skill set. And as a result, knock themselves way out of the sweet spot for flow. Or you'll see it at work, right? Other people will do it for you. I'll give you a great example that we spend a lot of time talking to people about. So in sales, we'll see people have really get into like deep, deep, deep flow states and, you know, have really amazing quarters, right? And totally blow their quotas out of the water and really kill it for their companies. And then the boss comes along and says, oh, that's fantastic. That's great. Now do it again in half the time and we're going to double your quota. And as a result, those employees get knocked out of the challenge skill sweet spot, right? Because suddenly the task is so much harder and scarier and bigger, and it's just too much. It was too big of a step up. And as a result, the anxiety that gets produced will lock you out of flow. So interestingly, what you're seeing there is employers sort of knocking their top performers out of flow when what they really need is them to stay in flow. Right in that sweet spot. That's super fascinating. That's one example of a trigger. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting on a couple different levels. One being that it's environmental, right? Like a lot of it can be putting yourself in the right environment as opposed to, you know, kind of like a mindset shift, which I'm sure there is an element of that in the 20 triggers. But this idea that like you need to put yourself in the proper environment where you're being challenged just the right amount, I think is really interesting. Yeah. And, and you got to, you, you also have to, Find it for yourself, right? I mean, one of the things that's tricky about flow and people, you know, as I said, it's really easy to train, but it's tricky. And one of the reasons is what we don't know and what we think is that everybody sort of has different susceptibility to these 20 triggers, right? The ones that are going to work best for me aren't going to work best for you, Jonathan, and so forth. So you have to really conduct the experiments yourself. And for example, in my writing, I have discovered that I'm in that 4% sweet spot when kind of the level of truth I'm telling, if especially, you know, if I'm writing anything that's got anything to do with me, my experiences, my life, the truth I'm telling, the level of it, I'm, I just feel a little exposed. I'm a little mm-hmm. vulnerable. Like I'm showing a little bit more of myself than maybe I, I want to, but that's the secret spot, both for communicating with readers and for, you know, keeping me in flow. One example. Wow. I really, really like that. I've definitely experienced that as well. I do my best writing when it's like, oh, this is this is a little much. Are, are people going to want to read this? How are they going to react? And I also like, or you could get another different way, right? Like I have discovered that as a general rule, I 700 words a day, which is about what I write when I'm working on a book, which is most of the days, is just outside that challenge skills sweet spot. You know what I mean? Like I can get it done, but it's going to take some effort. I'm going to sweat. I can do, you know, 300 words with my eyes closed, 400 words. I have to start really kind of paying attention. 
500 words, it's getting difficult. 600 words, I had to have a, a little breakthrough along the way. And 700 words, I maybe needed a couple breakthroughs, right? Wow. And so 700 words a day, I, it, it actually changes. So when I'm starting a book, it's 500 words a day. When I'm finishing a book, it's 1,000. When I'm in the middle, it's 700. But I've run those experiments over and over and over and over to figure out, well, what is, what is the sweet spot that will consistently produce the most flow? Right. And sort of do that. So like, again, you know, those numbers work for me. They tend to work for a lot of people, by the way, you know, in in teaching, writing and flow and things along those lines. We tend to find that those numbers work for a lot of people. They may, you know, maybe 400, 600 and 700. You know what I mean? But slight different. But that's sort of the that's sort of the sweet spot. You'll find if you listen to professional writers talk, you start asking them how much do they produce a day? all the answers are going to be in right in that same place. And there's probably like a lot of neurobiological reasons for it, right? Super interesting because I'm thinking to myself like yesterday I had a pretty profound flow experience and it had to do with changing my environment and it had to do with shutting off all distractions and a lot of different factors that were different than my normal thing. But I wrote, I think, about 3,000 words. And I'm just wondering like am I a binge flower? Because instead of consistently writing, as you said, 700 words, I waited until it was, it had been so long that I did some quality writing that I had to go to a different workspace and surround myself with different people and shut off all my digital devices to binge out these 3,000 words. A couple of things, right? You also, like, I'm just listening to you. So novelty, new environment, right, Mm -hmm. is another flow trigger. Brain Mm -hmm. loves novelty, totally drives focus, right? Like, Novelty is a huge, 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 novel environments produce huge spikes in dopamine, one of the brain's principal pleasure drugs, one of the brain's principal focusing drugs, and most important. Epinephrine as well. Yep, right. You also get more pattern recognition when you get dopamine and norepinephrine flowing through your system, so you'll find links between ideas. So you you put yourself into an environment that was sort of packed with flow triggers. And also, I mean, by the way, when I work with organizations, very first thing I tell them is, Hey, if you can't put a sign on your door that says F- off, I'm flowing, you're screwed. Because what right. the research shows is that flow requires 90 to 120 minutes of uninterrupted space for concentration. And Tim Ferriss, he argues that, and I think he's right on this, that if you're doing something really hard and creative, you know, 90 to 120 minutes is sort of what you need daily. And then a couple times a week, you're going to need four or five hours of, exactly. of block time. Right. Exactly. And I think that I think those are very true. But like, you know, so, you know, if you work for an organization that makes you respond to messages in 15 minutes or email in an hour or you tend to do that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. it's a disaster. I mean, it's exactly it's a, you know, I get up at, you know, three thirty in the morning, four o'clock in the morning every day to start writing. And one of the reasons I do it is the phone doesn't ring. My phones are turned off. My email's turned off. There's no social media. You know what I mean? It's pitch black. The only thing I see is the computer screen. And even there, I use focus view. So I literally only see the page I'm working on. There's nothing else in my universe, right? And, you know, I've got, sometimes I'll pull up, darken all the windows so I don't have to see the sun come. You know what I mean? So I, I don't know. So I can stay in that space a little bit longer. People love to claim that they can multitask really well, or they love to claim that uh, it's just a little notification that pops up. And, you know, I'm not actually going to reply to the message. I'd just like to know there's no emergencies. So they have these little notifications that pop up on their screen, you know, the emails, the whatever. And I have found, and I'm pretty confident you found as well, that I cannot get into flow, even if I'm not engaging with those messages, just having them pop into my field of view. It's too tempting. And then you go hours and hours trying to write breaking your concentration every 10 minutes, you know? There's three things on that one. One, we know, well, we don't know on everybody, I guess, but we know from studies done on coders, and maybe it varies career to career, but with coders, when they get knocked out of flow, it takes them about 15 minutes to get back in on average. Mm -hmm. So if you're in flow and one of those messages pops up and it's enough to knock you out, and I'll talk about why that will happen in half a second, you just cost yourself. I mean, think about it this way. If you're 500% more productive in flow and you have a three hour work window to get something done, think about how much work that 15 minute knockout just cost you. That's exactly. insane. For one non-critical message. Let me put it a different way. So 
the biggest thing you mentioned it, you like so anxiety, which is essentially norepinephrine, is a really funny drug, right? A little bit of it. It's a great focusing drug. It's fantastic. It feels like excitement, drives performance, drives curiosity. It's great. Too much of it, total anxiety. The problem is that the higher up that scale you move, while your ability to focus may increase, your ability to be creative decreases. And the reason why is norepinephrine sort of shuts down the ability for the pattern recognition system to make far-flung connections between ideas. The more fear in the system, the more familiar your thoughts are going to be. And, you know, the extreme version of this is fight or flight, right? Where you are faced with extreme fear and you've got two options, right? So, and th this is neurobiological. And so if one of those little messages pops up and it's got some little bit of emotional tag for you, right? Like it's something that there's emotions involved, whatever, that could produce norepinephrine and knock you out of the sweet spot and suddenly you're not getting back into flow at all. And, and more importantly, because we're all so unbelievably crunched for time and we feel time pressure all the time, you may not be paying attention to those alerts, but your brain is going, oh yeah, I got to respond to that. Oh yeah, I got to respond to that. Oh yeah, I got to respond to that. And it's doing two things. One, it's trying to save energy for later when you have to respond to those things. And two, it's making you more anxious. So you're saving energy. So suddenly you have less energy going into what you're doing right now. And you've put more anxiety into the system. So you're no longer in the sweet spot for flow. And You've knocked yourself out of the state for about 15 minutes minimum. High, high, high consequences. And you know, I mean, this is my buddy Clifford Ness's work at, at Stanford. Nobody multitasks. It's absolute bullshit. Right. Your brain is not built. It's a serial processing machine. It can process in parallel on a lot of levels. But when you, you talk about conscious attention, it's a serial processing machine. And there's no such thing as multitasking. And a study Absolutely. after study right shows like i mean and the performance declines for people who try are ridiculous i saw something this morning and i wish i could figure out what i was looking at because i would cite this study but they were talking about people trying to multitask by writing email and maybe taking notes on a lecture at the same time i want to say and they they measured something like a ten thousand percent decrease in performance like it was some stratospheric number that I was like, well, how the hell did you even measure that? Like, what is that? That doesn't even make any sense. So I don't know if it makes any sense, but, uh, or I don't know if that research, you know, bears out because I didn't take a deeper look at it, admittedly. But, it, you know, it's interesting that, that we're finding the decline is huge across the board. This is so motivating because this week I finally put a line in the sand. I already do, by the way, maker manager days. I'm theoretically supposed to have two days a week where I'm just not available, period. I don't do emails. I don't do chats, like nothing. And even in those days, I have little things creeping into my time and popping up. And uh, I took a stand finally this week and just decided that, it, you know, if I want to write and I want to create and I want to actually get shit done, then I have to go full with it and, and completely close everything except for, you know, that does provide a little bit of anxiety because it's like what's going on in the company. Servers could be crashing, you know, worlds could be burning and I have no idea, but uh, I've had two of the most productive days ever since making that decision. Yeah, I like, it's funny. When I think about my career and I think about like, you know, this stuff that, you know, what did it take to write, you know, seven bestsellers and get two Pulitzer Prize nominations, right? Like, was there secret Kung Fu in there and the flow stuff helped a lot and blah, blah, But honest to God, I think it's that I just kept saying no. Anytime somebody offered me a job where I would lose control of my schedule at any level, the answer was always no. I never became an editor because it would take time. I never, like, I could have given up book writing and had a career in advertising, but I'm not giving up. You know what I mean? Like, I just said no. I protected my schedule as fiercely as I protected anything in my life. You know, I preach that, and yet somehow it creeps up on you. And you you make so much time, and you're like, oh, well, I have time. I could volunteer and do this and do that, and I could answer a couple of customer emails here and there. And then it just creeps up, and it, it snowballs. It really is... I found 
as you said, a black and a white, like just no, there's no, I'll do a little bit. And that's something that I'm working my way back to is just no, no, I, I'm not on Slack three days a week. It's a no, it doesn't matter what's happening. So I really love that. And that's a reminder, kind of driving home something that I'm working on myself. Steven, I want to ask you other skills, habits, routines that you feel make you perform at a higher level. I mean, a lot of what you talked about felt like mindfulness training, but I'm sure there are other 430 in the morning sounds like a pretty good skill slash hack to make you perform better. Any other things that you do that uh, help you perform at the highest level? Well, I mean, the most important thing I do that helps me perform at the highest level is I hurl myself down mountains at high speeds as often as possible because I'm an action sports fanatic. So, and speed is the ultimate gateway into flow for me. So I try to have, you know, a confrontation with mortality at high speeds at least once or twice a week. Oh, wow. Because it, it really, you know, it really keeps my head dialed in. So, I mean, you know, not for everybody, but, uh, you know, risk is a big trigger for obvious reasons. Doesn't have to be physical risk. I happen to really like physical risk, emotional, psychological, social, intellectual, all those things work as well. But I use physical risk all the time and I really like it. And how are you carrying that forward? After you get off the mountain, do you then go and write or is it the other way around or is that different days? I write, remember I get up at 3.34, so I'll write <laughs> till about eight o'clock and then head towards the mountain. And when I come home, I try to do nothing. I try to keep my brain shut down. And I have, I, you know, I have a very active recovery practice that involves, you know, saunas and breath work in the saunas and then, then a handful of other things. And so I'm a big believer in active recovery as well. And um, I've also broken a lot of bones. So I tend to have to ice my body after I wow. ski. You aren't kidding about the risk factor. 83 bones and counting. You've broken... 83 bones? You have to understand that I spent the first six, seven years of my career chasing professional athletes around mountains. That was the first place I started to notice flow stuff. I didn't know what it was, but this is how when I got Lyme disease when I was 30, I knew what I was looking at because I kept seeing professional athletes and they would talk about it. You know, if they were stoned enough, they might say, yeah, you know, I get into this space and time slows down and I feel one with the mountain and it's really weird and it's really spiritual and I don't know what it is, but it makes me perform, right? <laughs> like you have, you hear those stories. I remember hearing Laird Hamilton describe a flow state when I was about I was probably 27, 28, the first time we met. And a part of me was sitting there thinking, well, I've had this exact same experience, but he sounds like an absolute raving hippie lunatic. And you can never say these things out loud. How could you even talk about it? And, you know, a couple of years later, I actually became the guy who figured out how to talk about it out loud without like sounding like a raving lunatic. But it took like four years to figure that one out. I saw it a lot. But if you're not a professional athlete and you chase professional athletes around mountains, you're going to break bones. And I broke a lot of them. You were a photographer or? I was a journalist and I started my career as a journalist. I mean, most of what I was doing was science journalism, but back then, this was early 90s, action sports were just happening and they were deep subculture, right? And I was an old school punk rocker, so I fit right in, but they were deep subculture and, you know, public was fascinated. The X Games just getting started, the Gravity Games, all that stuff. And, you know, if you could write and ski or write and climb or write and surf or write and whatever, there was work. And I was desperate for the work. So even if I couldn't do those things, I would lie to my editors, right? Which, you know, is how, you know, you'd find yourself on the top of some incredibly gnarly peak in the middle of Alaska, you know, just so far above your head, you can't even imagine. Uh, Stephen, I want to transition into, you know, some practical stuff that people can play with at home and ask you, uh, what's a piece of homework that people can try this week? So one thing I will tell you. So why don't we just talk about a couple other flow triggers that are really great. Sure. And I'll talk about one that gets overlooked all the time, which is called clear goals. And the idea here is we pay the most attention to the present moment, right? When we know what we're doing and we know what we're doing next. So most people 
screw this up because their goals are too big. Clear goals are really like moment by moment plans in a sense. I'm going to write a great sentence. Then I'm going to write another great sentence. Then I'm going to write another great sentence. Then I'm going to. So setting really clear goals, goals that are clear enough that you just can keep your attention focused on the present moment is really great. Now, interestingly, I'm guessing if you're listening to this podcast, there's a bunch of high performers listening to this podcast. High performers tend to be pretty good. You know, they, they've got their daily to-do lists. And if you're not making a daily to-do list, you're insane. Like, as far as I can tell, for a number of reasons, it, most importantly, you need to know when to declare a win. So I often think of clear goals as like a daily to-do list with sub goals kind of blocked in. And most people are really good at doing one thing in flow. And what happens is they're, you know, lots of focus, really, really intense. And then they're transitioning to task number two from their to-do list, right? And what do they do? They check social media or, you know, do any number of things that might be, could possibly be emotionally taxing. And Mm -hmm. if instead of doing that stuff, if you take your two minute break and do three sun salutations, or you do two minutes of breath of fire, and then go right back into your work without doing anything that could pull your focus out of the present moment Mm -hmm. in any way, right? Emotionally, and just go right into your next clear goal. You're going to carry your kind of low grade flow state from one task to another, and you're going to start to deepen it along the way. Right. And I'm going to give you one other thing, because I'll bet you did this to yourself yesterday, which is, did you keep working until you basically had nothing left because you were having such a good time and you were getting so much done? Kind of, yes. I went to lunch and then, you know, had a, a friendly lunch with a friend and everything. And then I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to keep going. I'm I'm feeling pretty good. So I had a break, but yeah, I came home from the workspace and just crushed it. And did you have a hard time working today or an easy time? Today was pretty easy, but it was a different kind of work. Today was my phone calls day. Oh, okay. So did different kind of work. Because one of the things that often happens, so interestingly, if you for, let's talk about writing for a sec. A lot of writers, I learned it from Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Josh Waitskins talks about it, Hemingway talked about it, but they all say when you're doing a work session or a writing session, I, I think it's any work session, it's a long project, right? Mm-hmm. And you've gotten into a flow state, it's going really, really well, quit when you're most excited. Interesting. And the reason is twofold. One, the hardest thing to do is to get back into flow when you're starting cold, right? So you need to stack motivations, right? You need a lot of stuff that's going to drive focus into the present moment, right? And if you left off when you were excited, you will bring that excitement to the next day's work, right? So what is more important to understand is the neurochemistry here. So we talked about norepinephrine and dopamine as the brain's principal focusing chemicals, and they're big flow drivers, right? Mm -hmm. Turns out they're also very short-lived chemicals. You can only have sort of maximum saturation of those chemicals for about 20 minutes. This is why TED Talks, 20 minutes long, because most of us can really pay peak attention for about 20 minutes. Or this is also why, and once those neurochemicals are gone, by the way, it takes a while for the supply to to reboot, right? You need minerals and vitamins and food and sunshine and a bunch of crap. Um, So it takes a little while. So you've all had this experience. You've seen like a James Bond movie where there's lots of explosions, lots of things grabbing hold of your attention, exciting, fun. And about half an hour into the movie, you're exhausted, right? And you've got another hour and a half to sit through. That's because you've used up all your norepinephrine and dopamine because all that excitement has claimed it from you, right? So when you're deep in flow, you're using up a lot of norepinephrine and dopamine. By the time you notice, right, oh my God, this is amazing, this is great, you have probably gone through a bunch of your supply. So by fighting for those extra kind of hour of work on the back end, what you're doing is you're taxing the last of your resources and it's going to be harder to do it the next day. Wow. That's really interesting. So you should almost plan your weekends. I mean, I guess it, it kind of lends credit to what I'm doing, which is I break up my writing days. So I have a calls and recordings day in between. 
where I don't really need to be as creative. It's just, you know, ticking off emails and ticking off things in Asana. Yeah. So what I have noticed, for example, is on a, the day after I say go skiing, right, or go mountain biking or whatever, that's going to be usually going to be a really great flow state for me the morning after because I've had flow the night before. And, you know, creative flow tends to follow fairly quickly. And uh, Teresa Modley at Harvard discovered that the heightened creativity you get in a flow state will outlast the flow state by a day, sometimes two. And it's a big boost. It's like 400 to 700% boost in creativity in flow. Wow. So a huge spike. Yeah, huge, huge spike. So I, I'll use that heightened creativity. But the day after that, I know I'm going to be like, I had a big flow state while skiing. I had another one while writing. I know I'm going to not be able to produce a whole lot. I just know. Mm. So I may ask myself under those conditions to produce 400 words instead of 700 words. And that's exactly, I'll do the same thing as you. I'll schedule, you know, all the stuff I have to do for PR or marketing or phone calls or podcasts or, you know, I'll, you know, record my TV shows or whatever. That stuff will get done then. Brilliant. Because I actually did want to ask you, you know, as, as we talked about getting into flow state, you know, I think the obvious question is like, what's the limit? Can I really spend eight hours in flow? Can I really do it every single day? So like, what's a good goal now that we know that you can't spend unlimited time in flow? Like, what's a good reasonable goal for people to try, you know, hours per day, days per week? So to one data point before I can answer that question, flow is a spectrum experience. It's like any emotion, right? Mm -hmm. Anger, a little irked, homicidally murderous, same emotion, flows the same way. <laughs> We know, so the state has seven core characteristics. I listed them, uninterrupted concentration in the present moment, the vanishing of self, time dilation, time passing strangely, a couple others. These are the characteristics of flow that show up in most every flow state. You can have micro flow where a couple of those things show up or where all of them show up, but really at a low level. So this is what happens when you sit down to write that quickie email and you look up an hour later and you realize you've written an entire essay right? And maybe you mm -hmm. forgot what your body felt like along the way. And you're like, Oh, my God, look what I've written. And oh, wow, do I have to take a piss, right? That experience, that's micro flow, macro flow, which is the other extreme, right? When all the characters show up at once, feels like, you know, to many a full blown mystical experience. In fact, for the first 70 years that scientists, scientists were looking at this state, they thought it was a spiritual experience. They thought it was a mystical experience. They thought only religious and spiritual people could get it. And it wasn't until Abraham Maslow discovered flow in a study group packed with atheists in the 50s that this idea, that idea went away. But uh, you can have two, three micro flow states a day, right? You won't stay in them perpetually. But like if you get good at this on a good day, you might too – two, maybe three, but like that's after years of working at this stuff, right? What starts happening really quickly though is that you start finding those micro flow states show up more frequently and more frequently. And more importantly, the more you work with this stuff, the time between flow states sh can shrink, but you can't live in flow. It's kind of neurobiologically impossible, <laughs> you know, or, you know, if you do live in flow, we have a different term for it. We call it schizophrenia, <laughs> right? So and that doesn't tend to work so well. We have a, the mania as well. So that, you know, there are, right. there's a limit. And more importantly, and this is really critical because I don't, so many people miss this point. The information, the real information, right? I mean, like what flow is great for is yes, it has massively have some performance, but it really dials up insight. That's that, you know, creativity, insight, that kind of inspiration, those kinds of things go through the roof. And um, that's fantastic, but the information is really rich because it is different from daily life. It's in the difference, right? The pleasure of a flow state is in the fact that, oh my God, it doesn't feel like normal life, right? That's one of the reasons it's so amazing and it works, but you want both. And in fact, I will tell you, so often what happens in a flow state, flow is what happens when you're You've learned a bunch of stuff consciously, and suddenly your subconscious knows it well enough that it can do it automatically at a, better than you could do it consciously. And usually, like, it's a number of skills coming together at once, right? And mm -hmm. what happens is that you get this view of, oh my God, look at how good I can be in a state of peak performance. And then you'll spend three months, six months, a year, 
two years, whatever, learning, training yourself up sort of to get to be able to do that under normal conditions. And that's in a sense, the, the technical term for this is the high perch experience. You sort of see the next vista of possibility. I can go this far. The error a lot of people make, and there's there's neurobiological reasons for this, is they think that they're going to be able to pull it off in like a week or two, and they come back down and you know they realize that like it's a much longer stretch. But I, at the end of it, there's a there's a day when you usually can pull off all the stuff you just pulled off in flow, out of flow, and it feels terrible. It's totally unpleasant, but it feels right. like so much victory. It is such a victorious day. So I think the contrast is really important. And I think knowing, you know, getting to see this inflow, you know, especially because it's underpinned by so many feel good neurochemicals, you'll charge towards that goal. It'll just amp up motivation. You'll move in that direction. If people take away just one message from this and they're able to remember it and carry it with them for the rest of their lives, what would you hope for that one to be? I don't have one message. That's the, <laughs> that's the real, that's the real point there. That's a message in and of itself, I suppose, right? Like, honest to God, and th I, Jonathan, I don't mean to jump down your throat on this one, but like, everybody wants it. What are the three things I can do Monday morning that change? I shut the f up. Seriously, <laughs> this is life. You get one shot at this. That's what, what, what do we know for sure is you get one shot at this life, and you're going to spend a third of it asleep, right? So what you do with the other two thirds is the only question that matters. And you don't want three things you can do Monday morning. You want to do it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You know what I mean? You want to do it every day for the rest of your life because you may never get to have this particular ro roller coaster ride again. If what you've heard on Flow Research Collective Radio has been helpful, please consider doing us a solid and leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this. Reviews help us connect to a wider audience so we can get these peak performance principles out to more people. 